Well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mike Thornton. Uh, I come from, uh, I'm a freelance Pro Tools specialist. Uh, I work here in Manchester with a number of broadcast clients. I'm also the post production editor for a site called Pro Tools Expert. A um, little brief history into uh, where I've come from. Uh, I started as an apprentice in uh, 1976 working for Marconi's when they still were in the broadcast sector. Uh, became an engineer at Piccadilly Radio and Key 103. In fact, I built Key 103 when it was in the Piccadilly Plaza. Uh, but I've been freelance since 1990, working as a sound OB engineer, and then I built and set up the Omnibus Mobile, which uh, was the first uh, live broadcast in Dolby Surround in the UK. And before moving on to Pro Tools, I've been working with Pro Tools since version 2. Uh, and de developing, as I say, workflows in the uh, broadcast set context when Pro Tools was really not a broadcast tool. This is version two where it was four tracks on a good day with a following wind. And so most of my work is within Pro Tools for both radio and television, uh, working largely in drama and documentaries. I'm working on a Radio 3 uh, drama for Christmas at the moment which is a combination of uh, live music recordings as well as uh, drama set on a uh, Scottish island. Um, so that will be on Radio 3 just before Christmas. Um, as I say, Pro Tools experts, uh, we have around 150,000 unique visits every month. It is a worldwide exclusive Pro Tools community. Um, our weekly podcast, which of course I'm making Pro Tools, uh, with contributions from around the world uh, that we're now currently getting around 10,000 downloads uh, a week and we also do a lot of training videos and you can see that uh, we have one or two uh, videos accessed within a year. So that's where I'm coming from so let's get into uh, what we uh, are here to do. Um, We'll, the session really is looking at the challenges of audio post-production when the material is being self-shot and possibly self-edited. So often self-shooters, uh, of those of you in the room who, who do it, effectively you are trying to do two, three things at once. You're trying to direct, you're trying to be the cameraman, and you're trying to be the sound recordist. And in reality, with anything of that nature, whether it's this particular context or any context, we tend to be able to do two things out of the three very well, and the third one suffers. And unfortunately, and you may well say that I would say this, uh, sound tends to suffer. That said, I, I know a number of clients who acknowledge that, and uh, they bring in a sound recordist on the key elements of their production, so that when the sound is really important, they have uh, a specialist in on uh, that, those particular sections. And that's one of the ways that uh, you can actually save money. I know it seems, hang on, I'm employing another person. How does that save me money? Well, uh, you can either spend the money with the sound recordist and get good sound to start with, or you can spend the money with me in the edit when I have to spend so much more time fixing it. Your choice. Um, and certainly, if you get the opportunity, and again, I suppose I'm also speaking to the per people who acquire for themselves, it's always worth having a conversation with the person that's going to be doing the post-production uh, because, uh, again, those clients of mine who talk to me, I can advise them on perhaps the best way to get the sound uh, for a particular situation, uh, and it makes all our lives a lot easier but we'll be looking at some of those tricks and techniques uh, as we go through. So um, this is a fairly typical uh, project uh, that's come in to me. So this is, in fact, an OMF import from uh, a project. Uh, and you can see that we've got some of the tracks um, laid out. So that top, that the, the, the top track there, you've got um, the, the original source material, you can see that like the third region in, it's different content on the top track to the bottom track. Um, and so one of the things I will do is having imported the OMF, um, so that's the way that we get the audio out of the video editor, whether it's Avid uh, or Final Cut, 
uh, when it comes into me in this sort of format, then I would start going through this material because often the video editor will want to have the sound on as few tracks as possible so that it isn't increasing the height of what he needs to see in his, in his uh, timeline. I don't want lots of different content on the same tracks. When it comes to me actually doing the edit, I want to put appropriate material on appropriate tracks. So if we have a look here, the top little uh, screenshot there is, is, is the same one you just had a look at, and the bottom screenshot is, is the way I've laid it out. And so you can see that uh, all the duplication across the top two tracks, I've now checkerboarded it, so there's one, just one track, because if it's mono, if it's the, both the same audio on both tracks, there's no need for me to have it twice. Um, but, and then, but on the occasions when the content is different, because quite often what happens is with a self-shooter, you may well have the radio mic uh, on one camera channel of the, and then the, either the camera mic or a, or a boom mic on the other channel. And one of the things I do straight away is I go through and listen to it and establish which one sounds better. And it won't always be one or the other. There have been a number of times when I've chosen not to use the radio mic and I've used the, the camera mic because the radio mic's suffering from clothing, Russell, or it's just where it's being put, it's so really, really, it's horrible, whereas the camera mic is a much more natural sound. So I've gone through and checked and worked my way through. So if, hopefully, this now all works, I go to Pro Tools. Come on. Yep, there we are. Now we've got a real project. So in fact, what we've got here is a, a, that very similar section. So here you can see that we've got some very different content On, on one of the tracks and nothing on the other. So let's have a listen to that. So that's quite iffy. Bring the video window. So whoa, that's got a load of stuff. So there's a bit of supermarket material and then some stripe. This mincing machine, and that was what was given to me um, so what I chose to do is to get rid of that and down here on the sound effects so I tra so what I did is that these top four tracks are the original as it came in from the OMF and I've just relayed it so I've got now two sync tracks sync A and sync B and so those are my sync sounds and then I've tracked additional sound effects down underneath. So here we've got the, um, the, so the, the sound of the supermarket and then if we move down here I've now re replaced that. Hang on a second, finger trouble. So we've got the British supermarket Pacific sound effects, which is straight from my sound effects CDs. The British still from the After Effects. Then we've got some uh, cows. The British still from the After Effects of BS. Typical situation when you're working in demonstration there we are that might now the work. British public still reeling from the after effects of BSE and salmonella distrusted scientists we must not try people. we don't like that so again what I've had to do is a lot of the original sounds were not particularly useful so I've gone in and taken a number of sound effects from my package 
um, and being able to, t so I've now got four different sound effects tracks um, to be able to enable me to, to get that to function. Just bear with me a moment. I'm struggling because I can only see a small amount of the screen. I'm just going to do a plan uh, B, so hopefully you might better see a bit more. Just to PowerPoint. It's not going to work. <sighs> so what I've done is I've spent a long time going through each of the tracks. If I just go back into PowerPoint, um, and I, so some of the key issues, uh, the sound will be of variable sound quality. You know, we're dealing with material that, were, you know, microphones, personal microphones that may well have been put on people who aren't skilled at actually fitting mics. Um, the, if you're using the camera mic, the camera may be a little bit far away from the sound source, or if it's a boom mic, again, you may well be dealing with a production secretary who's been given the job of sound recordist. Um, and so what I do is I spend quite a long time going through each clip one at a time, trying to identify what I can do to improve the sound. Um, one of the other problems that I get is, especially with uh, shots that are, don't have dialogue in them, so I, I've done a number of programs where there's been uh, crime scene reconstructions, and I've got the sync sound has arrived, um, but the problem is the director is talking all over it, saying, uh, can you move here, can you do this, can you do that? So the sound is completely useless for me because all the actual action of whatever it is they're reconstructing is now lost. So again, a plea if you're shooting this sort of material, please don't talk over the, the, when, you're, when you're trying to create these shots. Explain what you need to do, then shoot it and stay stum and, and work it that way. Because again, it saves me time in having to reconstruct it all, which means it saves you money. Um, so certainly with things of those short, when you're doing establishing shots, walk by shots, whatever it is, try and make sure that you're not it, briefing the talent or having a conversation with somebody else whilst these shots are taking place. Um, sometimes I get nothing at all, no sound at all. It's mute. So again, the number of reconstruction sequences I've had where there is no sound at all. And so that basically means I'm going to be into a situation where I'm going to have to track lay it, bring out sound effects from my sound effects collection, and build up the sequence to make it believable. So um, again, for people uh, uh, self-shooting, one of the easiest ways uh, of working is to either put the camera mic or a boom mic on one channel of the camera sound, and to use a radio mic on the other channel, or maybe use two radio mics um, and, and handle it that way. As long as you can put those down, and as long as the recording level isn't too quiet or so loud that it's distorting, I have a more than a fighting chance of being able to turn it into a good crafted product. Um, so one of the other problems we have is that when I get this uh, content from the video editor and again it may well be the same person as who shot it self edited self uh, self shot self edited is because the video editor doesn't want to have loads of audio tracks 
that I have a mix of mono content and stereo content across a number of tracks. And so one of the, again, one of the things I will do is to work my way through that, spend quite a bit of time identifying which of the tracks are going to work better, which of the tracks is mono if they're duplicated. Sometimes they can be duplicated, but it, the level of one of them is slightly higher or lower than the other. So again, it gives me choices. And so I, I spend a long time going through that process because actually it pays off in the end and it also gives me the opportunity to get to know the content. Because of course, being a self shooter, you will know this content inside out, back to front. This is all new to me, but it starts to get me a handle on what I've got and what I need to potentially replace. Uh, or where I've got nothing at all, what I need to add. So I spend, as I say, a lot of time rearranging it. Um, and then once I've got all those tracks rearranged in my timeline on my tracks, so I've got dedicated sync tracks, tracks, tracks for sync audio, dedicated sound effects tracks, dedicated music tracks. Once I've laid all that out, then I can start to get to work with it. And one of the first things that I'll do is to actually start cleaning some of the content up. Initially with uh, EQ, but sometimes I will use a product called Isotope RX2. Um, I recently did a, a series of videos for Isotope. Uh, you can get them, um, the link is there. Um, you can get the, have a look at these videos. And I actually went through and produced these videos in real time. So I didn't cheat, you know, this sort of sequence where it says sequence was shortened for dramatic, you know, for, to save time. What I wanted to do was to actually show how I can get rid of hum, how I can get rid of background noise. So there are a number of, of, of videos there. There's one uh, with a mobile phone, the acoustic, you know, the actual text alert goes off mid-interview. What do you do? Uh, and I show how I was able to clean that up completely. Another scenario where the mobile phone, although it's on mute, the interference, the chirpies brr, brr, sound was on the recording. I show how to clean that up. Um, problem with a wedding uh, shoot where the stills photographer was going around shooting Kudunk and had the loud, world's loudest camera shutter noise. And I show how you can take that shutter noise out even though somebody is speaking at the same time. So a range of different uh, tricks that you can use uh, with uh, Isotope RX2. Uh, very, very useful tool. Um, and, so, and so I've got, so I did these, these little short videos for Isotope themselves. And then I've also produced a three hour video training tutorial uh, which is available on the Groove 3 website. Link for that will be at the end, so don't worry if you haven't written it down. So having done all the cleanup process, then uh, I can look at how I can actually, what additional sounds I need to add. And so again, there, there have been times when I've had sequences um, with uh, the, the and, and often what I find out is people are using archive footage. So archive footage, very cost effective way of getting footage you can't afford to otherwise get. But most of the time archive footage comes with a pre-mixed soundtrack on it. So it may have commentary, it may have music. So the sound that actually comes with that is completely useless because it, it, you know, it, it, it's rare that you can get back to the archive sound and just get the effects or the, you know, the clean effects on it, it will be a mixed track. And so I need to look at how I can effectively retrack lay those sequences to make them believable. So it may well be a series of Atmoses, like you saw with the supermarket, actually finding a supermarket sound effect, uh, just a bed track, finding the, uh, an appropriate sound that goes with what you can see. But of course, it needs to be believable. So in order to do this effectively, you do need to have a comprehensive sound effects library. I have a fully cataloged library within my Pro Tools. I use the Digibase Pro feature. I don't use a third party sound effects system. I have my catalog within uh, Pro Tools using the Digibase Pro library. 
and I have something like 50,000 50, sound effects fully catalogued. So I can go in, I can do keyword searches, find the, the sounds that I want, audition them from within Pro Tools. I'm not having to leave Pro Tools, go searching through sound effects CDs. They're all on a hard drive. I can search, keyword search from within Pro Tools, audition them, find the ones I want, drag them out of the library, straight onto the timeline, and away we go. So, uh, but I think the last point is key, especially with documentary, etc., is not to go over the top with the track lay. Don't provide sound effects for every last little detail. The chances are that most of the time this footage will be underscore. There will be commentary taking place over the top of it. So it's going to be subtle information underneath. So it's about providing enough sound cues to make it believable without going completely ballistic and finding every last little detail. Because frankly, the, with the, especially with these sorts of projects, the budget won't be there. You won't have the time, therefore the, or won't have the budget, therefore the time to spend forever perhaps track laying it to the extent that one might do if it was a feature film. So, uh, one, some other tips and tricks. Uh, create templates. Um, so, I have a number of template sessions. So, I have template sessions already built up for, so they have the sound effects tracks, the music tracks, all the subgrouping into stems with the appropriate plugins for limiters uh, and process so that I can create in one pass both the mix track as well as the M&E track, the music and effects. In other words, everything except the voiceover. So that for most international repurposing, what they need to better do is to redo the voiceover in their native language. And they tend to subtitle most of the interview content. So that, for most productions, is, works absolutely fine. However, as I say, it's well worth asking the production company if there is likely to be any international sales from this product. Because if there are, you know, a lot of the time the, the music and effects, the M&E track and the full mix will cover it. But more and more international uh, broadcasters are wanting more complex stems. So they don't just want an M&E track. They want the music as a separate pair of tracks. They want all the sound effects as a separate pair of tracks. They want all the interview material, separate pair of tracks, commentary by itself. So you're producing a range of stem mixes. So because of that, I've now built up a series of template sessions which do all of that. So when I come to do the final layoff, the final finished product, what some people do is they do the mix and then they go back in and mute certain tracks and then go all the way through the program again, producing the stem mixes. That takes a lot of time. With a carefully crafted template, I can produce in one pass, I can produce all those stem mixes and the final mix and the M&E mix all in one pass. So at the end of my final layoff, I have all those as files, which I can put together and deliver in whatever format the, uh, the client needs. So again, use, uh, and, and even now, even if there's the vaguest hint that that might happen, I do it anyway, even if there isn't a specific requirement. Because when the client comes back to, you, to me in two years' time, which has happened, and says, Mike, I've sold this program to wherever. Have you got the stems, etc.? cetera? Um, yes, not a problem. Let me just pull up my archive drive. Here we go. Done. I haven't had to go back in and remix it. And, and, and again, the client is, you know, client think it's wonderful. Oh, yeah, all right. Maybe you say, well, you shouldn't have done that because then you could have got the money for doing all the international reversioning later. Perhaps. But that client remembers that I saved them a load of money and a lot of grief because I'd done some thinking. That client is much more likely to come back and use me again than if I'd have fleeced them for doing all the international reversioning. So, a lot of this, as I'm sure most of you are well aware, is just actually relating to people and looking after your clients. 
looking after them because they're the people that are going to come back to you or if they don't come back to you because they haven't got another project, they'll tell their mates about what you've done. And so um, the use of templates really does help to uh, save time and money. And so the client remembers that and it really, really does help. Okay, so uh, there are some details, the links of the various uh, isotope products at the bottom there. Uh, I'm very happy to take any questions. Yes, sir. How does the uh, Isotope RX2 uh, program compare to things like the Waves plugin, Z Noise, X Noise, all that sort of okay. stuff? Is it along the same kind of line? Yeah. Um, a gentleman asked me how does Isotope RX2 compare to Waves uh, like the Z Noise, the X Noise, uh, the, the various. There are a variety of um, restoration software. Uh, one of the reasons I like RX2 is that it now functions as a standalone product. So I tend not to use RX2 as a plugin. It has a separate standalone application. So I will take the file out of Pro Tools, process it in RX2, where I'm not constrained by the limits of what the plugin can or can't do. Because within RX2, there are a number of algorithm models that work non-real time. So you can audition them off, you know, it, offline ish. You, so you can audition them, but when you come to the render, they, the quality is much better than the, than the real time version. And some of the plug it, some of the tools within RX really only function very well when you're in the standalone application. Now, what I would love Isotope to do is to produce what I call a handout, hand back applications. For instance, there's an application by a company called Synchro Arts called Revoice Pro. It's all about a li lining up um, uh, dub tracks. So if you're doing a, you're having to revoice stuff, do, uh, then you can it lines it up in sync. And they've developed this really good little app plugin where you tell you tell it in Pro Tools, I want to take that track, that bit, and that bit. E exports into the standalone application. You work on it in the standalone application, and then you tell it which bit, which track in the standalone application you want to bring back, back into Pro Tools, and that works really well. But to come back to your original question, um, I did a, a number of A-B comparison tests with a wide range of the plugins, and although there are some Waves plugins which I absolutely love, I found the Waves plugins not amazingly effective. And to a degree, some of the Waves plugins are using much older technology. Um, RX2 and the new Sonox restoration package using much more up-to-date models and algorithms. And so they are inherently going to be a lot, lot better at uh, doing all the restoration stuff. And also within RX, for instance, there's no the spectral repair, which is the tool I use to take the camera shutter out, doesn't exist in the way any of the Waves plugins. The, now the de-clicking for, for de-clicking a, a vinyl record, yes, the Waves one does it. It's not stunning. The Isotope RX is absolutely stunning. Um, now you again, you may say, well, he would say that he's been working for them. Yes, I have. You know, I'll be honest, but. If you ask me what tool I use for restoration work, the answer is RX2. That's what I use. Now, I'm now, having spent so much time working on it, I really am inside it completely and utterly. There are two versions of RX2. There is the standard RX2, which is around the 300 pound mark. And then there's RX2 Advanced, which adds a few letter extra features. But there's very, very little that you can't do one way and another in the standard RX. Anybody else? Yep. Hang on a sec. Hello. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Um, I'm just wondering, as someone who's sort of new to this and wants to do this as a living, if we go freelance, what's a general sort of base rate for charging this? Obviously, saving money, you say, 
you know, we want to save them money, but it's very difficult to find out how much we should be charging because if you charge too little, then it doesn't look like you're professional. But if you charge too much, then you don't get any work. And it's, it's a really tricky thing to kind of to judge. Uh, it, it is. Um, and it really depends also. Uh, there, there are a number of factors about what you can charge. One of the things is how experienced you are. Because you know, it's, you know, it's the situation with a lawyer. A lawyer can charge three, four hundred pounds an hour, easy, because they've gone through so much training and they have that experience. And that's what you're paying for. You know, not that the fact that if they got 50 pounds an hour, that would be enough to live off. You're, you're paying for that experience. So part of your rate setting is actually, you come to me because I'm really, or whoever, I'm just using me as an example, but you come to me, then I have a load of experience so I can deliver the job quickly and effectively. There probably won't be much that I've not seen or done one way and another. With somebody starting off, you're not, you don't have that advantage to start with. So often the case is, is doing projects with friends, maybe doing somebody's uh, film that you get to know and slowly building up your reputation. My, my reputation is built on client recommendation, uh, full stop. But of course, it is a bit of a chicken and egg situation. So it is a little bit around doing your market research and finding out what the going rate is, is to find out what you think you can afford to charge. Because you're absolutely right. If you, you undercharge, then you are, what you're, you're, you're devaluing yourself. And that's something that I so often see with freelancers is that they undercharge. And actually what it says is, this guy, I, I, I'm not worth paying any more than that. And that is, is a problem. So it's a little bit of market research, finding out what the going rate is for the job, uh, finding out what the BBC will pay as a freelancer, just as, a, as a, somebody in the crew, but of course, you've then got to consider if you're, if you're using all your own kit. I mean, I have my own 5-1 post-production suite. Um, and so I've got to build that into the price, the fact that I'm going to have to replace that every three years. And so that's got to be built into the price. So you do need to have a, a business model. OK? Anybody else? Yeah, guy at the back there. Hi. Um, I, I don't know if you've explained... Uh, sorry, it is on. I just can't quite hear you well enough. Yeah, so I don't know if you've explained already about templates in, yes. um, in Pro Tools. Um, but is that, kind, is that is it kind of like grouping things? No, okay. Together or...? Uh, it is, but not. But that's not the, the, the concept. They're asking about templates. Templates really are effectively dummy sessions which either contain some or no content. So when you st if you start a project from, from fresh, when you first create a new session in Pro Tools, it has no tracks, nothing. You need to build up, create, you know, go into the new track menu, create track, how many, audio, how many mono audio tracks do I need, how many stereo audio tracks. If you don't have templates, every time you start a new project, you have to go through that process again each time you start a new project. If you have template sessions, then they're like stock sessions with tracks laid out the way you want them to be laid out, already named it's FX1, FX2, FSX3, Music 1, Music 2. They're pre-laid out, so if you open, if you work for, when you, if you use a template session, then it, you go new session and then there's an option to go from the template open it, an existing template when you open that instead of getting a, a an edit window and a mix window with no tracks in it you end up with an edit window and a mix window with all the you know, with a really good starter in terms of the tracks you're likely to need on a project and certainly when it gets to the more complex parts of where i'm doing stem mixes there is a lot of clever routing within pro tools so that I can send uh, the stem mixes, the subgroups, to both tracks that I can record on and also th route through the other subgroups to create the main mix and the M&E mixes. Now, yes, I could do that every time I create a new session, or I can do it once, save it as a template, and then 
it's, it's available for me to every time. So it's like in a word processing document. You can set all the fonts up, you can set out the, the colors and all the rest of it, you can do it every time, or you can have a template which has all those things ready so that you don't spend time doing the same thing over and over and over. Does that help? Yeah? Okay, um, that's it. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, we have just one last thing. We have a Pro Tools uh, meetup in the show bar. So I'll be uh, over there in a few minutes' time. Five o'clock it starts. So if you want to ask any more questions or you want to talk to me personally, then I'll be in the show bar at 5 p.m. for Pro Tools Expert meetup. Thank you very much.